We're live. Thank you for being here, Aaron. No problem, Christian. It's a pleasure. Uh, well, I'd love to hear about your upbringing in Modesto, you know, a little farm town and, and what life was like for you before, before you got to Cal. Yeah. So it might sound a little familiar to you. Um, but yeah, Modesto, when I was there was, was still a small farm town and, um, yeah, I think, you know, basically it was like faith, football and family, um, in no particular order. Um, and you know, I, it was a very conservative little town and, um, you know, every Friday night, um, the whole town would go to football games and, um, actually my brother was, uh, he was a pretty darn good football player. He actually played at Cal mm -hmm. as well. And so he, um, yeah, it, it was it was basically, I remember my childhood was a lot of going to football games, going to other sports, sporting games. But if you played a sport, um, at least in my, you know, family culture, if you will, it was like, you know, you, you were important. Um, and so that's kind of where I was as a young kid, like I was, I was mediocre, uh, at everything. Like I did track and field, um, you know, I did hurdles, I did you know, basketball, that was, that was my passion at, you know, uh, growing up, but um, yeah, I was like pretty good at everything, but not great at anything, but I just did a lot of different activities, like physical activities. Yeah. So you're always just active moving around and just kind of enjoying life, but there wasn't a sport yet that was pulling you in one direction. No, no. And I, I mean, like, I think Another one to add to the mix was like, I grew up dancing um, as a super little kid. Like I started getting into it when I was really young. And um, it's just such an, that's an interesting culture in itself of like this, it was classical ballet. Oh, wow. And so just kind of getting, yeah, as a young kid, like having this extreme amount of structure and you know what's aesthetically pleasing or what's not there was like a lot of like you know what's good what's bad um but also just really being very conscientious of particular body movements and where you are in space i think was a, a very interesting part of my upbringing and actually my brothers he danced uh quite a bit when he was growing up too so um yeah i mean in the end it, i think it really helped helped me um and my brother get to where we were in other in other sporting worlds well, i mean they talk about like ballet and, and dancing and, and i mean even yoga how beneficial that is for for athletes but you know from a male's perspective you kind of sometimes don't want to admit that you're doing those sorts of things but they're so so beneficial yeah yeah no i mean i think i think it you know, I don't have kids yet, but as I, um, I watch my nieces grow up and they, you know, they stuck them in, in gymnastics and it's just so interesting to see how, yeah, the, these like kind of performing arts, how it trains kids who are, you know, learning to get their, their coordinate, their motor movements and how, how quickly they adapt and just sponge it up when, yeah, when there is kind of a routine or you're, you're doing it to music, you know, and, um, yeah, I think it's a good foundation for sure. Um, but like any, any, you know, performing world, there's, there's always the underbelly of it too. But um, yeah, I think it was a, it was a cool thing to do growing up. Well, let's talk the million dollar question. And which is why I have the whole podcast is what dream were you chasing? Mm. Yeah, so I, um, that's, yeah, I think that I, was I was listening to some of your other episodes, I was like, I don't know if I, I was really chasing a dream, to be quite honest, when I was uh, growing up. I mean, I didn't even dream, like I couldn't even fathom going to the Olympics. Wow. Um, you know, it was something, uh, I'm gonna date myself, or like a kid of the eighties, like we had the IBM computer games where you would like <laughs> press the space bar to like, take strokes on that was my only exposure to rowing is like every time press the space bar is like you took a stroke and it was probably one of the most boring games on um the you know this IBM computer game for the Olympics but um 
Yeah. I mean, I, it was always just, again, like I was, I was, you know, a female kind of growing up in this very conservative, um, you know, masculine dominated world. And I was like, I don't play football. So what else, like, what could I do, you know? Um, and I was okay at basketball. And so I just, I just figured I would, um, you know, go to Berkeley and, um, you know, at the time my, my dream and aspiration was to be a lawyer. Um, this is, you know, endearing comments from my parents being like, you, uh, know how to, you argue very well with us. And so you should, you should take and make that into a career, um, subliminate it into a career. But, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I just didn't think I really had it in me. Um, you know, my dad played football in college as well and rugby as well, but he, you know, it was just something that I think the, the women in my family, I didn't really have a model for that. Um, and so, but as I was going to college, I knew I wanted a balance. Like I knew I wanted, I didn't want to just be so, you know, in my head, like I, I, um, I didn't, I don't think I consciously knew this, but like I go deep down rabbit holes. And so if I was just doing one thing, I knew I would kind of get lost in that one thing. So, um, and I just really enjoyed being part of a team. Um, I just really enjoyed, um, working and being with other people. And so, um, that was when, yeah, one faded morning in my, on my senior year, um, in high school, my dad left this newspaper article, on the kitchen counter about, you know, this girl who was rowing, um, in my rival town over Turlock. Um, and so she, she got a full ride scholarship, um, to row and was trying out for the national team. And my, you know, spicy, feisty self was like, she can do it. I can do it. Um, and so I just started calling her around different rowing schools. And this was still at the time when, you know, rowing was, um, not, I mean, it was all, I think it's always kind of been a big um, sport on the East Coast, but still on the West Coast, it was really just in its infancy. So, um, yeah, I was going around up and down the West Coast, not quite doing my homework. I don't know if Google was much of a oh, much of an entity at that point, but um, yeah, I didn't really do my homework and was calling, you know, University of Washington, um, Stanford, of course. Cal um being like oh you know I haven't rode before and can I just walk onto your team um and so uh they they all asked me there you know there's this um I, I like to think of it this is like the SAT of the rowing world is the 2000 meter test yep it doesn't tell you everything about an athlete but it tells you a lot of things you know uh-huh. it'll tell you kind of like what your potential is and where you're at right now um, as far as, you know, your suffering capacity, yep. <laughs> this is the best thing it measures. So it's just like, it's like doing, I mean, the distance is a little over a mile, but it's like doing a mile, like flat out, you know, it's just brutal. It sucks. Um, but that is, you know, it, it's a very helpful measure for, um, for coaches to separate, you know, or at least see the capacity yep. of, Gauge of the athlete. Are. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, they all asked me what my two, what my two K score was. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Get back to you. Yeah. Let me so go. I found, yeah. You no, know, that's exactly what I did. So I, I looked around and I was like, found a, um, I found a new program. I think it was like in second year in Stockton. Good old Stockton, California. Um, still the 209, but yeah, I don't, I don't need to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I went there and, um, you know, it was full of a bunch of lovely, you know, humans. Um, we we're all kind of like the rejects of other sports it, it, and, you know, took ownership of that. Like, and, and that was kind of like our identity in sure. a way. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just like sat down on a, you know, Model B, which is like the first, second iteration of these rowing machines. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to sit down and do 2000 meters. And I, you know, every time I tell the story that the score goes up, but yeah, it was, it was not great. It was like around nine minutes. And so I went and called all the other schools and I was like, Hey, I did it. And told them, you know, my score and I didn't hear back from anybody except for Cal. Oh, 
um, yeah. So um, Tom Homo was the um, Cal um, football head coach at the time. My brother was there. So my brother was there in his like freshman year. Yeah. And there's always these like family get togethers and whatever afterwards. So I'd gotten to know him pretty well um, and had talked to him about like, Hey, yeah, I want to come to Cal and, you know, I'm trying to get on the rowing team. And so he actually reached out to the head coach and put in a good word. And so by the time he circled back with this score, they're like, we know you, like, we hear your brother's like a really good athlete and, you know, you have some good genetics and just, we're just going to pretend like you, you never told us that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it kind of went from there. Um, but they, yeah, they tagged my application and I was able to walk on, um, be a, what is that, recruited walk on um, yep. at Cal. Oh, yeah. God. Hold on. Before I touch on that whole story, what you go in with a nine minute. Tell me, what was your times like when you're in the Olympics? Like you're at your peak, like how much of a difference was it? Mm, yeah, yeah, no, it it got, uh, thankfully, I didn't have to suffer as long towards the end. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I, like, I like to say, um, especially on rowing, it's it, it doesn't hurt less. You just go faster. You just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do you know you hurt for less amount of time but um yeah I at the end there I think I my my PR was the 639 um the two was, and a half three and what is that yeah two and a half yeah two and a half minutes faster yeah 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 so I mean that's yeah. considerable. Um, obviously in your sport like that's a that's a massive difference so just to think about like where you came in versus you know, really where you needed to be to, to be in the position you were and to do everything that you went on to do was, was a world difference. Yeah. Yeah. But this is, I mean, I think it just also speaks to, I mean, and I, I know that there are certain aspects of, um, you know, physical aspects of athletes that I think really help them tune in to specific sports and excel right and help them get to their dream but I think the biggest attribute I had and served me really well in rowing is um consistency yeah. like I would just wake up and go again wake up go again and even in within you know a race it's like oh that was a bad one okay let's do it again and so I think um my ability you know for better or for worse to forget you know what happened before to go again um really served me well in the sport and I think that's you know I'm coaching right now I'm coaching um a uh, high school team in in Oakland um trying to get more of the Oakland public schools involved um in the sport and you know access to to scholarships and educational opportunities but that's what I just keep on telling them like doesn't matter if the last stroke was bad just do it again you oh, know that's... just go again that's so, so and mm -hmm. that, that's so that aligns so well with one of the guys that I really look up to. His name's Ed Milet. And I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh he talks no, about, tell me about him. You know, he talks about consistency is just more important than anything, and especially more important than motivation. And it's just mm -hmm. that a daily reminder to keep going and try to take, you know, one step every day. But also the the awareness and in, in being okay with the fact that not every day is gonna be perfect. And in my, in my life, it's not every practice or every game or every play I make is going to be great. Um, but as long as I just keep showing up the next day with, with somewhat of an intent to get better and whatnot consistently, over mm -hmm. time, that, that's, that's the recipe. And yeah. you're fortunate that you had that, you know, mindset from an early, you know, from an early age and in the infancy stages of your sport. Um, and so I, I think a lot of people need to hear that and it could resonate with them and, and help them get confidence in the fact that it's okay to get it wrong some days. It's totally okay. And it, and it, you know, those are actually some of the most important practices as well when you're just, you know, banging your head against the wall <laughs> and actually, sorry, the most important practice is the next day, right? It's like getting back on the horse. Yep. Um, yep. And how can you kind of come, you know, come and show up um and just 
do what you need to do and you know with this knowing of like hey it can be this bad but then also kind of hanging on to like how you know that sensation of when you do find that groove you know when you do find that you know other people call it flow or whatever you want to call it like both of those things are possible in any yep. given moment yeah no that's amazing what's so cool about your story Aaron is you went on to win medals, go to two Olympics and whatnot, but that that career started so late relative to probably a lot of a lot of other rowers. And it just rings so true to what I'm trying to t- preach here is that like, number one, no dream is too big. And number two, it doesn't matter what you did in the past. It's about what you do today and tomorrow. Um, mm. I, just lo- I love your story. Yeah. Well, thanks, Christian. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm like soaking in those words as I'm embarking on a new career too and it's but I yeah it's it's very humbling to be in this place of like you know I don't you know my you know parents didn't really have the the or at least I didn't see my again my the female um relatives um pursuing anything this physical and and um competitive and so I don't really have a model there and then I was also you know like a kind of average size athlete and like that I, I didn't have the attributes or the model or the dream really um because I had just didn't think it was possible but it, again I think the when I began to realize it was possible was when I just realized it was just a game of showing up and the more I did that you know it's not like I had to do anything spectacular but if I was dependable and consistent enough I would um one earn the trust of my teammates and then and coach of course but yep. you know mostly I wanted to earn the trust of my teammates um and two like you know our body mind and soul like favors consistency like it really we do really do adapt to things that that we get multiple exposures to yep. um so yeah I, I think it is you know not to undermine you know I had some um you know, a lot of privileges that, that allowed me to get to where I was. It's not that I was like, you know, and, you know, I had just general abilities and, um, you know, support from, from family and and friends and, you know, decent background, uh, with dancing rhythm and, you know, athleticism, but it really in the end was a game of showing up. Absolutely. And I mean, you can call them privileges, luck, whatever you may call it, but I'm a firm believer that you create your own luck and you create your own opportunities and probably you going through everything you did in life and just had, having that consistent mindset of wanting to do more, explore new opportunities, or just kind of chase a little passion of yours that ended up opening up all these opportunities for you. Yeah. Yeah. And if you will indulge me, one of the things that kind of drew me into my new career, like I'm pivoted, um, I guess it was, pivoted more inward um, into the psychology field is that I I do think that there is something, you know, we're, we spend a lot of time trying to measure these physical aspects, especially in the sporting world, you know, time, um, distance, you, you know, weight, all of these measurables, yeah. because it's so hard to measure the psychological components and what as actually feeling. Um, but I think that's where this luck or these intangibles really, really are influencing people's careers more than, yeah, more than, you know, any physical aspect. Absolutely. That's so cool. You, you, you touched on that because it wasn't until I started working with my sports psychologist where I really think everything in my life changed the way I played, but also the way I kind of perceived the game and also perceived myself. Um, Mm. I put so much validity and my identity in the sport of rugby where it controlled my life and it consumed me entirely. Um, Mm -hmm. um, And I just, I let games and outcomes influence everything in my life. And it Mm -hmm. became detrimental Um, and I was underperforming, which in my eyes, I was, who knows if I actually was, um, Hmm. whatnot. And so once I went down that rabbit hole and kind of put my ego aside 
and was like, Hey, let's, let's figure out why I'm feeling like this and maybe why I'm not playing the way I should and started diving into my mind is when I regained my love for the game. I started playing free and I basically understood that what I do doesn't define who I am. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of people struggle from the mental aspect of, of sports and also what they do in their career. And if they can at least confront those conversations and maybe be helped with like a psychologist or somebody who really understands the mind, it could be a, you know, it could be life-changing. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I'm, it makes me very curious and you don't need to share if you don't feel comfortable, but like what, yeah. Why did you feel like you needed to be driven to, um, be identify, you know, identify yourself with the wins and losses? Was there like something that a breakthrough or a thought of like, why did you feel like you needed to be so attached to your results or? I think it was more so like thinking that rugby was my whole life and that people were going to have opinions on me depending on if I'm winning or losing, if I'm playing well, if I'm playing poorly. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. probably, and I know it's not the case, but that's what I was thinking. And those were the conversations mm -hmm. that were going on in my head. And I think I was always playing the sport um, to, to, to gain validity or, or, or praise from other people. It was like an outward thinking rather than mm -hmm reminding myself why I actually loved playing the game. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there were some things from childhood, which I had an amazing childhood. Don't like, it wasn't anything wrong. It was just moments that we brought up in the past that maybe were the reason and the foundation for some of those thought patterns. And then we just mm -hmm. confronted them. And then we also talked about how it's okay to get it wrong and just to have confidence to fail sometimes because like, you're never going to have a perfect game. And I think I was always chasing perfection. I wasn't chasing progress. Um, mm -hmm. so it's just daily reminders that like, it's okay to get it wrong sometimes. Um, it's a game yeah. at the, end of the day. And it's so good that I love it so much. And I'm happy I love it so much. But let's remind yourself why you play. It's not for any other reason than I really enjoy the game. I love traveling the world. I love being around a team environment. Like those are the things that I always, that I started to forget. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of helped you like recenter on those. Yeah. 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 So I have like this working theory and of course, like this is, I'm still um, a pot of one in the, in the psychology world, but like it definitely, I'm starting to hear these themes of, um, and, and also kind of read, you know, other, other folks research about how that's so common for, for athletes, for high performing athletes, and actually um, just other professions, people yeah. in high performing roles to have um, what we would call these unstable um, personality traits in, you know, the, the civilian world, if you will. So it's like yeah. perfectionism, obsessiveness, um, narcissism in a way, you know, yeah. um, to be able to become great at your craft. And I think this is kind of like where I'm curious is like, are there people who actually are able to manifest themselves in, you know, these high performing roles, if you will, that don't have these, you know, demons if you will that we or at least we deem them as demons like that aren't kind of like stirring this like not good enough you know and because you have to have something um at least this is what I think like you have to have something that you're either running away from or running to that's so charged that feels so real um you know in order to again show up and wake up and put yourself through some pretty damn painful things like you're overriding a lot of psychology <laughs> like I also think sometimes like looking at my um you know high school athletes who are like you know kind of having a hard time sometimes with these like 6,000 meters so I'm like I think your brain is like more intact than mine like they, you were overriding a lot of these pain signals right in order to be great at something yep. so there has to be like kind of to your your theme of the podcast like there's a dream that you're running to, but there, I think there also might be something that we're running away from as oh, well. That's so just true. as like potent, you know? Oh my God. And there's a question, 
which I was going to ask you a bit later, but it, and, and all the people on the show, we've kind of talked about where some people are driven by the fear of failure and some people mm -hmm. are driven by winning. And mm -hmm. for me, I was driven by the fear of failure for so long. Mm -hmm. And it got me into this cycle of, you know, in high school, you know, I didn't party much. I didn't drink much. And probably Friday nights, I'm, I'm going to the gym, like, kind of like a weirdo. And I'm the DD on the weekends yeah. and always eating like the, the right meals. You know, we're going to go out with my family for dinner and, I, and I'm going to get the healthiest option on the menu when my brother or dad may begin a burger and like, you know, that those sort of things. Mm -hmm. And I realize, you know, I can look back on them and be like, okay, you know, maybe I was a bit crazy and I was a perfectionist and I was obsessed, but if I'm being honest, I don't think I would, I would be where I'm at today had I not mm -hmm. been like that. And that was like a yeah. 10 or 12 year span of my life. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I do think to your point, there, there's something that's bigger than ourselves. There's something that we're chasing so hard that almost gives us reasoning to some of those behaviors. Mm-hmm. I could not agree more. Yeah. I think that there has to be something that's, um, and you know, I, I, I really hope, I mean, maybe this is why I'm, I'm in this field. Like I'm, I'm hoping to find the, these unicorns that are just actually just chasing this dream and, and they're, you know, enlightened, you know, best selves, mm -hmm. but I haven't, I, I think, that story is kind of boring, to be honest. Yeah, like well. this, but the you know the person that's just like totally realized, and they they're just doing this for the to find you know. And, and this was actually part of my story that I only felt that I I created because I only felt really comfortable sharing this with like elementary schools. But like yeah, I think part of it is to, to really see what you know your body can and mind can do. Um, but I think that there's another part of it that. Um, and thankfully, I feel like the platform is, is a lot more for, for professional athletes. It's a lot more open now to talk about the other parts that might be driving you. Yeah. But I think the other, like having a full spectrum of like actually talking about, you know, that you might be driven not just by love of the sport, you know, like that you might not be driven by like just wanting to, you know, really be with teammates. Like there is some, um, kind of deeper, darker insecurities that are just as powerful. And like you, it sounds like you are still like solidly in the journey and like following along, like that can only get you so far, right? If you're, if you're feeling that or feeding that wolf, if you will, yeah, um, yeah. you gotta, you gotta find another, yeah, another way to kind of like still hang on to that wolf. You're like, that's still part of me, but how do I kind of like feed this other wolf as well? And that, it's such a fine balance. And I think to touch on that, I'm coming, I'm at the point where like rugby is also a platform for me to do other things. And so for me, it's like the podcast, like it's, a, it's an amazing platform where I can share my story, chasing a dream and hopefully inspire someone else. And so mm -hmm. now that I know that, and I, and I do believe in that, that is adding like a good light to, to everything where now I'm chasing something for that regard, not just, you know, that little wolf talking to me, that is the darker side. Like there is somewhat of a balance now in my life between the two, which there wasn't before. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And, and whether it makes sense to you, it makes sense to me. It totally makes sense to me. Yeah. It totally makes sense to me. And I, I think, you know, and this is um, part of, was part of my journey of like, I, you know, afterwards kind of had a really brutal time transitioning from this, um, you know, I, I think it's just an identity is part of it, but the structure of the every day, you know, like I had structure and I had community around me every day. And so when I decided to retire, um, that was, that was probably one of the more challenging periods of my life. Um, and just trying to find, yeah, trying to find something that um, filled that same drive or like was able to satiate both of those drives has been really hard. It's been really, really freaking hard. Um, and that's, now? yeah, that? say that again. Has what you're doing now with, you know, with psych psychology started to fill that? Um, 
you know, like this is, I, I, it's starting to, but I've also, I'm also a little um, hesitant as well to like go so deeply down the rabbit hole, <laughs> if you will. Um, so I, I haven't put myself full cell into the psychology world as I did, you know, uh, when I was younger into um, the rowing and, and um, you know, human performance world. Um, I think, yeah, it's something that I'm like working through. It's like, it's okay. Like, you know, you're, that you said you learned before, like you can fail, um, you know, you probably, it's always worth just trying your best. But I also wanted to see if like I could hang on to a little bit more balance, um, whatever that may be, um, you know, with family, um, with friends, with, um, you know, just doing things that I actually enjoy versus just as I'm sure you are, uh, would be, this would sound familiar to you, but like, you know, waking up at, you know, 5 a.m. and doing an extra workout or waking up at 5 a.m. and reading another journal article or, you know, um, doing that extra mile versus actually just kind of like integrating with, with people around me. I, I, I lost that. Like I lost, um, I, I didn't prioritize my, the other parts of myself, um, and my relationships, um, while I was training. And that was something that, you know, I think I, I regret. Um, but I also think with regret kind of comes like, shows me what I value. So, um, so I, so the long answer is like, no, it doesn't feel as satiating, um, because I do love, I, I love to like, just go deep into something, but I haven't really allowed myself to, um, and so I'm just kind of like experimenting with, can I hold multiple things at once, you know, um, versus just going so deeply into one thing. Well, so, maybe, we'll see. Maybe you just haven't found that that one thing that that you're ready to dive deep into. True, true. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I, I think I think there's there's been plenty of things that um, you know, and it, also this is the other. I think this is the other part of luck if you will or you know the collective unconscious whatever you believe in um but you know it really no matter if it's a sport or your profession like there has to be in order to kind of maybe not even start but stay in it there has to be somebody that's um like your champion or that your your mentor or somebody that you even aspire to like even um, that's why I think these ideas of, of um, you know, these sporting gods, if you will, sometimes it's it's better just to to not meet them, to just kind of like hold them in this idealistic fashion. But I haven't really found my psychology god, if you will, and that I think that's okay. Like I think there's people I admire, um, but no, yeah, I, I just think that the field is so vast, and more than that. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's as important as like really finding, yeah, just finding how uh, the connection with people right in front of you too. Um, I, but it's, yeah. What I, were you saying? And so I, I listened to the, to the big C society podcast with, with you and Robert Paler. Oh yeah. Robert and I are great buddies. I went to high school with him, mm -hmm. played rugby and football with him. And then at Cal is when Rob got injured. And so when I got injured and it was not, it was an ACL. So it's, it's minimal compared to what, what Robert went through, but I thought my life ended, so to speak, you know, my career and everything and, and whatnot. And I had a conversation with Rob and he's like, dude, it, it, it could, it could be a lot worse. And he reminded me like every day, look for the, you know, start thinking about the things that are so good in your life. Stop just thinking about the things that, that aren't there or the things that you, you want. And that reminded me, when I'm having conversations like that with myself or, or things may not seem so perfect in my life, I just have to remind myself that I've got so much more than I actually realize. Um, and to hear from a guy like Robert who turned his situation from something devastating and, and, and tragic to something just miraculous. 
is always a, a constant reminder. And, and, and it, I, lo I loved his piece and his advice to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is, I mean, it's extremely powerful. It's one thing to hear the words. And I imagine, you know, you just knowing, you know, him and what like a solid human being and character he is like just his actions speaks so much more powerfully than than but those words are those words are pretty pretty darn good too yeah, no, he's, he's, yeah. he speaks pretty well uh we've been on yeah. some of these, like tangents but I'd, I'd love to segue into your time training for the olympics um mm -hmm. and you got you know you started at cal and and now you're you're in the deep end of of rowing um and what your life was like and when was it that you knew you know, there, were, there was a potential career path in the sport. Um, career is a, is a heavy word, especially in the Olympic sports, yeah. or at least in my Olympic sport. But yeah, I guess it was, a, you know, it was definitely a career. Um, just uh, we, you know, it, it's a very amateur sport. I guess that's why I, I kind of laugh at that. Um, Whereas, you know, other sports like snowboarding and swimming, like it, you can actually legitimately, and rugby, um, you can legitimately make a career out of it and, um, you know, life. But um, for, for rowing in the U.S. in particular, you know, in other countries, it's very different. But I, I just did it, you know, again, I, I think there was a, there was a couple of things um, feeding this was you know I walked onto a damn good team um I did I had no idea um but again it was, it was something that was just luck or you know whatever it may be I the Cal had a um a new coach at the time Dave O'Neill and he brought the team to its first NCAA well sorry excuse me um I think it was like second or third NCAA championship, but we had kind of had a drought for a while. And then after that, you know, he just kept on building a team, recruiting internationally more. Um, you know, some of my dearest friends are from Serbia and you know, different parts of, of the Eastern Bloc over there. And um, they, we just, we had a stacked team. And so by the time I reached my senior year, we were, I mean, we were kind of like an all-star team, if you will. We had like Canadian, Serbian, you know, other kids from all around, all around the country that were, were really freaking good um, and strong. And so, yeah, 2005 um, was the first year we won NCAAs. And that kind of put us on the map, um, especially with national team coaches, right? That kind of piques their interest, like who who's in that boat? And I was like one of, we had like half the boat was um you know uh people from the u.s and so he would come to watch and them you know i was in the back of the boat again i'm like extremely undersized for for a rowing athlete and so he would kind of come to watch them and became friends with my coach and then i just i just remember kind of being like yeah i i don't know like i i feel like i don't ha really have a chance uh but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to get noticed. And one of the um, Debo is, um, I mean, as any good coach, he had, you know, has like the one for the gippers, but he would always say like, if you want to be noticed, do something noticeable. And um, so again, I couldn't do anything about my size, but I knew that this rowing machine um, was really weighty when it came to whether you would get into a boat, get into a school, um, be noticed or not. And so I just started training my ass off on this, on the rowing machine and getting um, pretty decent scores. And then um, I think another thing that one of my mentors at the time, Megan Cook, um, she was like a senior, just took me under her wing, another kind of smaller athlete. And she, she basically said, you know, you don't have to be the fastest one in the boat you just have to make other people go fast. And so that was what I did. Like every boat I went in, I wanted it that to be their, their fastest and their best piece. Wow. Um, 
And so in rowing kind of, um, you know, it's a little bit somewhat easier to do uh, because you're, you can actually make the boat more comfortable. Like you can set the boat. And so then it feels more like this, the erg, the rowing machine that's like stable on land. And one of the things that's so tricky about actually being on the water is like, it's tippy. Like we're in these like skinny boats and there and to do like very precise blade work. Like it's, it's hard. You're like slapping the water. And every time you like hit the water, you get dragged. And so I just learned how to set a boat and um, basically make it feel really light and easy to keep going for, for the big engines that were usually in front of me. So that, that seemed to do, um, I, I still think I wasn't really noticed by the national team coach, but my, my college coach, um, Dale said, Hey, like, I think you, you should try this like under 23. There's like the level before the senior team, um, you should try it out. I mean, what do you got to lose? Like, yeah. you weren't even thinking, it wasn't even on your radar before. So, um, yeah, I went out there. Um, there was a, I remember having to lie on the application. They said, you know, you have to be at least 5'10". And um, I think that was in, I don't think they had a weight requirement at the time. But basically, I was like, you know, I'm five. I like to say I'm 5'9", but, you know, 5'8 <laughs> yeah. and something. Um, but yeah, I just was like, yep, 5'10". You know, I think at that time I had like a 6'55 or and I was like, come at me. <laughs> like, okay. you know, like... <laughs> um and so just showed up and you know obviously I wasn't quite as tall but just again showed up every day worked hard um and uh you know at the time again it it was just like a little bit of luck or whatever it may be um the team the U.S. rowing development wasn't com really developed there's like 10 of us trying out for you know we couldn't even make a full boat so there was a we entered um, a four, like a straight four, which is, it's like a, it's kind of like a bigger boat, but they're super fast, super tippy. Um, so it was kind of an interesting boat class for us to enter when, yeah, we're not super experienced, but somehow I ended up at stroke seat, which is the, you know, well, I guess it's technically the back of the boat because we're going backwards. Um, but that's the person who just like, sets the pace sets the the rhythm and all that and um yeah at under 23 is like I think we were last off the line I mean that's probably a good guess I'm, I'm usually last off the line because you know I just don't have the power but then just kept on chipping away and we won in under 23s and so I think that's what got me um a bid to try out for the the senior team um but I like to say like, you know, they never really kicked me out <laughs> once I got to Princeton to the training center. Um, and uh, yeah, I, it was, it was, it was challenging because when I walked onto the senior team, they had just set a world record. Wow, for... so Johnson, kind of. Yeah. So it was like, all right, how are you going to break into this boat that just like, you know, the fastest in the world in history, you yeah. know? Um, but yeah, again, just kept on showing up and, um, you know, I'm sugarcoating it a little bit. I mean, it was, it was, it was challenging. Like I was injured a lot. I was injured a lot. And, um, I think again, to kind of find the silver lining of it, like I realized like I couldn't play the same game that everybody else was playing. Like I just wasn't physically, um, blessed <laughs> as much as they were and so I had to figure out another way to um to kind of hold my own in the boat um and so I I found you know actually my I attribute it to my brother like he was after he retired he kind of had this transition away from playing you know college football and he loved Olympic lifting. And so that was right when the CrossFit world was coming out. And so he's like, great, like everybody's Olympic lifting. Um, and so then he introduced that to me um, while, you know, the year before the 2008 Olympics, and he was just like, you need to start lifting. Um, Cause that's just not a thing. I mean, I think it's more of a thing now in rowing, but we would just 
yeah, we, we just treated ourselves like pure endurance athletes would just do miles and miles of training and not as much, um, you know, some core, if you will, but yeah, there wasn't any resist resistance training. So I added that in and, um, it, it kind of felt like cheating because it was, it was amazing how much more connected I felt every single stroke. And also how much easier it was for me to kind of, um, again, shift my body awareness to how other people's strokes were as well. And so I could match up with just about anybody. Physically then, because you said before you didn't have those physical gifts. um, And so did CrossFit almost get you on par and maybe even exceeding some others? Yeah. I mean, it, it, I just think of it as like a power per stroke game. And so, you know, if I, a lot of them had this like steep power curve, right? Like they just could really get after it. And, um, I, instead of like trying to play that game, like I was never going to be able to, you know, put as much power per stroke, but I could do it over a longer period of time and figure out how to use more my body weight as the lever, you know, versus my, my limbs and the length as the lever. So I was able to, yeah. And I still have been, I'm trying to teach my, um, my kiddos, uh, uh, you know, rowing the high school kids. Um, but it's, it really does. It is such a game changer. Once you start to work with your body versus just trying to muscle it, you know, and just trying to like, that's exhausting, you know, and, obviously it takes a lot more energy. So once I was able to really figure out, I think the Olympic lifting helps, but I also think more than that, like the gymnastics part of CrossFit really helped me to know how to use, yeah, my body weight and yeah. Was it a combination of it? Yeah. But was it just rowing in your life or given that, you know, rowing wasn't a career, like you said, were you working on the side Mm or uh, what other things? were? Yeah. Great question. Um, there's, you know, the, each coach kind of has their own philosophy, if you will, of like how to make a great team. Um, when I first started, I had a, I had a job. It was like an administrative job in um, some commodities trading firm, but I, um, I would sleep underneath the desk, like every day it was it was hard like it was brutal like I had to to just show up um and I was getting injured and so finally my parents were like if you want to do this like we'll support you but you gotta just you gotta go full full send um so um they were you know graciously supported me um financially and um I would say 90 percent of the people on the team did not you know, had either they took out loans or had parents that were able to support them, um, which is, you know, it's a differentiator for being, um, being able to row on the national team, unfortunately, is having, you know, either taking a risk to, you know, I can pay this back um, afterwards, or, um, you know, you have you have financial support from, from otherwise, but yeah, most of us were not working. Um, and on the men's team, on the men's side, that was actually a, um, mandate, like the, this coach, um, Mike Tatey was like, if you're not employable, then I actually don't want you on my team. Like, I I don't want to employ you on my team. And so he, he's like, you have to have something else. I think that was also part of his, um, kind of foresight and helping them transition out of, um you know, the, the rowing career, if you will. But, uh, yeah, my coach was like, we're, I'm going to train you really hard. And he did like, I would think we were, we were quite overtrained. Um, but still it, it worked well, um, a few times. Yeah. So most of us just fully were dedicated to, you know, we had six, about six hours of training, um, six days a week. And so, the other times it was like taking care of your body you know going to pt or acupuncture um eating you know whatever you needed to do yeah no i mean it's a 24-hour process it's funny though when i was going for the olympics for the tokyo olympics Mm -hmm. 
people think that Olympic sports are pretty glorified. Your life's good. You're making tons of money, whatnot. And, and I sit back and I think about my time. Did you ever train at Chula Vista? Oh, yeah, the Chula. Yep. So I lived there for, I think I was in the apartments right next door for about seven months. And then I lived in downtown for another five during my time down there. But yeah, I, I was working on the side. We're playing rugby every single day. And my mom and dad are still having to, I mean, essentially Venmo me to support mm -hmm. my career. And it's like, it's not what a lot of people think, but at the, I wasn't even thinking about it. I wasn't complaining because the sport, the dream, the chance to play for your country or not what and whatnot just superseded everything else. Um, mm. but I think a lot of people just don't realize what reality is like for some Olympics. Yeah. yeah, no, it's so true. I mean, especially when they just, you know, see our 14 minutes of glory on, you know, internationally televised I know. Uh, media and, and um, you know, and then, you know, you see folks that, that do get, you know, sports that do get a lot more sponsorship and, and they're way more visible. And so I think that's what I, I imagine where they, they kind of come up with this model or the standard of, of like, oh yeah, Olympic athletes are fine. And, um, you know, I think that's also the tricky part about, um, that I've, I've talked to, cause I, I've kind of been interested in this transition, you know, with athletes as well. And I've talked to some veterans about it, um, and looked at, cause there's a lot more research on veterans, um, yeah. you know, and how the challenging it, it, you know, there's a lot of things that parallel, um, with, with our careers. And so I think one of the things that, that, you know, has been very well researched and, and, you know, needs to be because there's there's a huge increase in mental health at least reporting you know um during that transition and so i just yeah i i just think that that's a that is a tricky time but i i think um having having some some stability while or something else while you're while you're training is ideal but it you know for some folks it's just not um it's just not doable and yeah. Yeah. And that's totally okay. And I think I'd love to hear your piece on this, that the way some coaching is going is so much more progressive where it's treating the person, not just as an athlete, but as a human. And so you touched on, you know, coach mm -hmm. Katie making that reference of if you're not employable, then I'm not going to coach you and whatnot. And it's like, I think it's so, it's so valuable because at the end of the day, you can only train for your sport so many hours a day or so many days a week until you're going to overtrain and then your performance yeah. is going to decline. And yeah. me, the more I do outside of rugby, the more value I, and the more I, I'm like kind of in it while I'm doing it because I'm taking less time to actually do it, if that makes sense. So instead of overtraining, yep. like I used to do now, if I yeah. only spend an hour in the gym today, I'm going to give everything I have to that one hour versus trying yeah. to train for three hours. Yeah. 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 You put, you have to be more efficient. And I think that's why, I mean, one of the, whether you have a job, you know, while you're training or not, I think that is one of the reasons athletes are so employable because they have had to, you know, balance or juggle, you know, multiple things, being a student and an athlete um, and having to, you know, deal with a lot of pressured situations if you will and um in different ways um but I think you know and this is honestly kind of where I I have I've made this error um on the other end of the spectrum but I think we do we all kind of have this Cartesian error of like if we spend too much if, if we don't pay attention to our body um then that will you know go away or we need to put all of our energy on our on our body and then what happens to our like our mind and soul, if you will, or spirit, like, it's just, we're not separate pieces for uh -huh. all. It's all one thing. So it totally makes sense that, yeah, if you're able to like feed other parts of you, then you're just more effective. Nathan Adrian and I had a conversation just about that. And he talked about the importance of putting energy into all aspects of your life, physical, mental, spiritual, um, cause we're just so connected and, and, but growing up as athletes, we're just so ingrained to 
do the physical work. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. will only get you in what he thinks to just a certain point in life. And it's once you start understanding the importance of the other two, you know, avenues, that's when sky could be the limit for people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's actually fascinating being in the psychology world where the error is kind of made on the other end. Like there's a lot of anti put into the psyche and the spirit, you know? Um, and I, again, this is part of, of what I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is just part of the culture. Like we just sit and think and talk. And I, yeah, it was, it just felt so, especially coming from, you know, the background and, and the, you know, my, what I had, um, growing up, like, it just felt so weird not to really be in your body, like just sitting and thinking and talking, it feels it. Yeah. It kind of just shut down, shuts down like a big part of you as well. And I know that's kind of foreign, um, especially probably for a lot of your listeners, since we're so focused on the physical, but yeah, I think we can get just as lost in the spiritual too. Definitely. And so from 08 to the 12 Olympics, um, you must've learned so much from the first time around and how did your, your training evolve? Where was your mind going from one to the other? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I'm sure you matured so, so quickly during that time, but I'd love to hear some of the lessons. Yeah. Um, after 08, so I was on a team for, for two years. Um, yeah, worked my way into the world record boat. Um, and we, so won. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was, yeah, it was very challenging, um, for sure, especially, and I, I think I kind of brush over it because it's still a sensitive story to me because the woman that I whose spot I took like on any given day like she could have had a better piece you know um when we did so how did how we differentiate in these big boats um again it's a very brutal kind of like stressful situation you like race in one lineup row to the dock switch one person out one person in race again come back to the dock one person out one person in and sometimes you'll do like switch the same pair you know four times um just to, to kind of get an average um but that uh, that you know and she she was you know brett was in the boat for you know the two years before we we're the same age same size actually and i just had so much respect for her and it just yeah it just kind of has really affected me of like how yeah, she, she pretty much did the same, similar things that I did. Like I, again, I went a little more off the, off the radar doing more strength and conditioning stuff, but um, yeah, I think it, it, there's so many, so many people and I am sure you can um, attest to this too, of like, it really, you know, that can make the team and that do make the team. And so it's, it's really hard you know, when you kind of have to let leave somebody on land, because they're still on the team for sure. But when you have to leave somebody on land, you're just like, you could do that. You could do this too. And, um, and how different, you know, our life paths have been because I wasn't on land that day, you know, but anyhow, so that's, that's why I think um, it's a little hard, but, you know, and to, still, it just seemed like, a, it seemed like a world whirlwind, you know, um, I, and so I was like, I got to do this again. Like I, I wanted to slow down. I actually want like a full, um, quadrennium to, to really like develop myself and, and really see, um, you know, cause again, I was kind of on the edge of making the team. I was like, you know, I think I, I have more capacity. Um, and, um, you know, another thing was, was standing on the podium in 2008. I just felt this, I was actually talking to somebody about this the other day, like I was fully prepared for this to be the, that to be the most joyous, you know, moment in my life. Um, and, you know, you kind of hear about it. You ask about it when you meet, you know, other medalists, like, what was that like to hear your national anthem and you know, to feel the thud? Oh, hey, pup. 
um yeah to feel like the thud of the you know metal hitting your chest um or actually usually it's your belly because they're so long but um and it is it is like this otherworldly experience of like you know it but I the thing that I was not prepared for was this immense sense of loss as well and so I felt this like full spectrum like I had you know the joy and the like holy shit (laughs) this is really happening but I was not prepared for this yeah sense of loss and like I don't know if it was emptiness but it was definitely this like um yeah unfulfilled like it felt like unfulfilling and I was like oh I must be doing this wrong like I I you know I need to try this again in a different way um, because if I'm on the podium, like where everybody is just hopes and dreams to be, and I'm not totally fulfilled, then shit, like what else is there, <laughs> you know? And so that was another, um, piece of me that, that drove me to do another, another quad, um, and train. And, um, yeah, I, you know, I learned, um, I actually, I think that quad was interesting kind of in reflecting on our conversation so far because I went way more inward I started kind of walling myself off to more friends and family and um just became very very single-minded um and it was damn effective like I was one of the fastest people on the team and there I didn't have this um yeah I didn't have the seat race before the 2012 Olympics you know I had a seat you know, I actually had the choice of what race, um, I wanted to be in. Um, and so then, you know, as fate would have it on in 2012, there I was on the podium again, here in the national anthem, you know, felt the thud of the, the London medals were even bigger. And so I was like, okay, now I'm really going to feel this like in a gut. Um, and I did, um, you know, like I, but I remember looking over at my teammates, just like these huge smiles on their faces, just almost like, you know, vibrating with um, this excitement. And just, and I remember they were crying, um, you know, some of them they were crying out of what I, what I perceived as joy. And I, you know, I've had some conversations with some of them afterwards and it was just like, yeah, that was like so awesome. Right. And I, I was crying out of like, again, this fear of loss of like, this is, I, it's not everything that I had hoped it would be, um, which is such a like hard story to tell, I think, um, especially on, on a podcast <laughs> to dream. But I think there is a very hopeful message in it in that like, I, I, I just, I think that, um there's there's so many there's again like I think what I was fueled by was this insecurity and to feel this like sense of okay now I've made it now I don't need to you know work on being better like I've made perfection if you will whatever that may be and so I just wanted that sense of of relief and from that you know unending drive and I didn't get it um and so I think the beauty of it is is just that there's so many different ways like there's so many different ways to fulfill yourself and you don't need to get to the top of the podium to do that um and I had to learn the hard lesson of like okay I'm just gonna you know yard sale everything and try to try to get rid of this like sense of insecurity and that's that's not it. So I, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm, you know, sometimes I, I think of it as, as just like, you know, you're climbing this mountain and you made it to the top and it's amazing. You have this amazing view and perspective and still you get to walk down that mountain. You know, there's still a huge journey ahead of you. Um, when you think, you know, climbing up was going to be the hardest thing, but climbing down is, is pretty darn precarious too. And, and then when you're at the bottom of the mountain, like looking up again. Um, but I, I think that's, 
um, as far as I, I can understand in, in my almost 40 years on this earth, like, I think that's, that's the journey. Like how many times can you kind of make that trek and um, what lessons of like humility will, will that teach you? And, you know, I got a big dose of humility um, on top of the podium for sure. That's incredible. And, and I do really, really appreciate you opening up and sharing, sharing that experience. And it, it, it rings so true to, to kind of what I felt. And now that I believe in is uh, we can't chase outcomes and mm -hmm. there's science and research behind your brain chemistry, um, pursuing goals versus when you achieve goals and the amount of dopamine release when the outcome is achieved is far less than the milestones chasing the goal. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's like everybody I've talked to now, we've done about 15 of these. They talk about falling in love with the journey and the process. Um, mm -hmm. you know, my buddy, Nate Ebner, who, who went to the Olympics for rugby, and he also won three Super Bowls with the Patriots, and he played in the NFL for 10 years. He goes, dude, Olympics, they come and go. Super Bowls, they come and go, and they're all cool. And, and each one's special and unique in their own way. But if you're not enjoying the journey and the process, then you're never going to appreciate anything else. And so it, mm -hmm. that just reminded me of, of his his words to me. And, and, and I feel for you in that moment because um, yeah, a medal. Well, you don't have to feel too bad for me. <laughs> No, but it, it's always been a dream of mine to be yeah. on a podium and win a medal. Mm -hmm. And um, when I didn't get named to the 12 for the Olympics, part of me felt like my life was over. But mm -hmm. the next day, I got a call from the national team on the other USA team because there's two variations of rugby. There's like tennis, sevens as singles, and doubles. Mm -hmm. We got sevens and the other variation. And um, I got called up to that national team. And it just reminded me that you know, when it, when one door closes, another opens. Yeah. The only thing I can do is focus on waking up the next day, putting one step in front of the next. And it just, that was a good kick in the butt for me was, you know, outcomes don't define who you are and being named or not being named to one team isn't going to dictate the rest of my life. No, no, not at all. And, you know, I think kind of like touches on this idea of, of like worth and um, at least for me, you know, like and kind of like, am I, am I worth as much if I don't make the team or if I don't fulfill other people's fantasies, you know, um, you know, because again, you know, I, I imagine plenty of women um, on my, on in my family who had the, genetics and but they just didn't have the, the the opportunities to to do this and so it felt like I was holding a lot of their hopes and dreams um to kind of become this you know sports star um people to do that just think that? Of the amount of women that were watching you receive your medal especially your mother like you may have felt lost but I bet you they felt so filled and so happy yeah it's like that's where I realized it's yeah. always about me. That's a beautiful way to think about it. I appreciate you bringing that in. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it slays me because she still has like a picture of my, of the medals on her phone. I'm like, mom, bro. Like that was like 10 years ago at this point, <laughs> but it really, I think, yeah, you bring up a really good point is like it, maybe the fulfillment um, in that phase of my life was, was more external um for other for other people and and that actually makes me feel okay about it um yeah, and, and but... I didn't realize that till I worked with a psychologist and he's like dude think about how proud mom and dad are even yeah. in your darkest moments and I'm like yeah I mean yeah you know, all the time how much they love me and how proud they are but I used to always put it in one ear and it goes out the other mm -hmm. and I'm starting mm -hmm. to realize that it carries a lot of weight and there's going to be a day where they don't get to tell me that. And mm -hmm. so I need to start appreciating it now. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, that's very true. It's very true. And I, um, I don't, 
I want to hold on to that and not undo it because I have a tendency to kind of like look at it, all angles of things. But I, I also, I also think it is hard, some, sometimes harder to find what fulfills you, you know, like in, in you're kind of saying like, yeah, it's this process and, and it's not going to be one moment or one thing. It's going to be totally fulfilling. But I, I do think, and then you go, you know, again, we all have, colorful childhoods um in some way shape or form but like i i do think sometimes especially in our western culture it's easier to fulfill other people's fantasies than your own yeah and, 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 yeah well said and some people think it's always a joyous road because if 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 i'm looking at your life before having this conversation and some of the things i read about you it's cows and if i'm saying it right ors ors person or oarsman oars woman oars woman yeah we'll, we'll make it up we'll is. make it up as we go you know, yeah. you're the most decorative oars woman at you know from cal and you're a two-time olympic medalist and all this stuff but you still you still experienced a lot of setbacks and a lot of emotional turmoil which nobody would even think nor yeah. they would have well. been a, taken a moment to think about that and it's like she's winning medals and all that and her life is so glamorous it's like hey yeah but the surface there's more to the story yeah no there there always there always is um that's kind of another reason why I, I went into the psychology field is like I I get the pleasure of knowing the depths of a human rather than just their surface yeah. you know I get to sit with people and really kind of understand or at least try to understand and help them even more importantly help them understand their story you know and I just think that's like it's so awesome because it's yeah it's it it's never it's never ending like the 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 surprises are never ending because you're just like I would not I mean you know the the beauty of humanity but also the darkness and the horrificness that of what people can do to other people and it's just like it's just beyond yeah beyond my experience you know I think that's why we read books or watch movies because it's just like trying to learn from other and just uh, yeah be um part of other people's experiences but yeah we are not we are not face value um on many different levels and I think that's what what makes us yeah what makes people so rad but I, I also just, yeah, I think there's a lot of pressure, especially on athletes to kind of um, appear as though they are healthy, you know, appear as though they, they have, um, you know, have it all together. And again, I, I think we're, we're such complex beings that, you know, the reason why we might be so structured or ritualized um, and rigid is because we're protecting ourselves from some pretty weighty, like feelings of uncertainty and insecurity. And, um, and we might not be, our, our healthy habits might not be fueled by healthy things, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that that's why it is interesting to kind of compare professional athletes to other um, professions, if you will, high-performing professions, because like we've kind of, it sounds like your experiences as well. Like it's not, it isn't as um, financially stable. Like, why are we doing this? If it's not going to, you know, feed ourselves or our families, um, there has, there's something deeper, you know, we aren't going to get, you know, VA benefits on the back end. Um, there's no, there's nothing in it beyond the moment and moments, as you're saying, you know, of, of, of glory, of, um, you know, brutal pain and, um, yeah, but there's something, there's something richer there than, than any material things can, can really fulfill is, is really it, you know, I think my, the story that I'm, I can kind of find in it. Yeah, before we wrap this up, like, would you go back and change anything now? Mm. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, I think, again, regret is a helpful emotion 
Um, I do think, you know, of course, every it's hard to change one puzzle piece because you're going to have to redo the whole puzzle um, or will it even fit, right? But I, I do think, um, I do think I, I had wish and, and I'm trying to do it now, wish I stayed more connected with family and friends um, and kind of kept those relationships um, more nurtured. Um, and so, it, yeah, I, I just think I, I became very, very internal. And um, again, I think it, I don't know if I would have been able to do what I did um, if any other way, but I, I do, again, I, I, I think all the fables in the world and, and all the cliches are true. Like it really is the relationships that matter. Um, and so if I, I just wish I had tended to, to those more. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful said, um, I want to end this on a, on a very light and, and positive note. And if there's a, <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm like bringing you into the I know, darkness. I know, but, no, yeah. that is amazing. but at the end of the day, everything that we've touched on is, is real and honest. And, and I wouldn't want to ha have conversations and have a podcast that's any different than reality because that's what I'm trying to uncover is, is what it takes at the end of the day. Uh, yeah. Is there any funny rowing stories you have for me? Did, did the boat ever tip over once? Like, um, I mean, it, yeah, it tipped over a couple of times, there not too many times, thankfully. Um, I'm trying to think of funny rowing stories here. Make I mean, my, Oh, yeah, tell me, tell me. I was going to say, I don't know if you knew or remember a guy named Nathan Davenport, but he went to Cal. He wrote, he's from New Zealand. He's my sister's boyfriend. He was telling uh -huh. me that they were at in New Zealand high school, about to go to college and brand new boat. And they started walking with it and they dropped it and shot in, in like whatever carbon fiber boat that's X amount of dollars. And he was it's like, just a cool 50K. Something like that. He and just he, dropped. He, yeah. just, he was like, oh shit. In their their faces and so that, that was one funny story i've heard yeah yeah i um i mean i had the pleasure of most of my most of my pair partners so when we would train in like smaller boats and then get together towards you know competition time in the, in the larger boats but the smaller boats are just heavier you had to have more skill and so they basically coach you um but most of my pair partners were just yeah, we were amazing, but they were, you know, a foot taller than I was pretty much. And so I had this um, uh, pair partner that, you know, I just kind of consider as a sister. Um, but yeah, Susan had, um, she just would, she had the best and worst sense of humor and would just uh, cox the boat, cox meaning, is meaning like coaching the boat and um when we're rowing like in different accents and it would just drive me so banana I can like oh, really? I don't know you can pick this up like I I was just like in a very intense in the boat um and so I just get so pissed and it's like you know it's, it's actually you know not PC either you oh. know we're rowing around and you know, you know these international competitions and she would just be like talking in different accents and I was like bro like just lock it up focus <laughs> just focus. focus um but yeah we had she always brought the joy and I I at the time yeah it drove me nuts I was like you're totally not like keeping your eye on the ball here like get your shit together um but yeah she brought laughs to everything that we did um yeah, some of them totally inappropriate, but um, yeah, I, I think I can't put my finger on on one situation, but it is good to have some levity in these super intense situations. But um, yeah, well, I, that that's good. We all need someone like that in our life, and I could name a couple teammates that are borderline. They need to watch what they're saying, but at the end of the day, they're giving me a laugh, and sometimes they they take the pressure off of the situation and just remind me that sometimes in life you, you need to have a good laugh and, and it's not all pressure and it's not, sometimes it can be fun and games. No. Yeah. They're definitely important 
parts of the team for sure. I mean, there's, yeah, there's so much like use and humor, especially when there's pain yeah, involved no, in yeah. all of it. You know, you got to, if you're not crying, you got to laugh about it. <laughs> well, this has been nothing but incredible. And I see the sun shining behind you. So you've got a beach to I attend. Know. Yep. Yep. I wish you We're up life. Christmas. Thank you. Very you well. as well. You as well. Thank you so much for reaching out. It was uh, a yeah, yeah, no, pleasure no. to talk to you. So hear good. a little bit yeah. more about your journey. Yep. Yep. So it's uh yeah. It's where, right. yeah, you were in the middle of it. I know. Where where are you now in your in your um who are you playing for and, and where are you uh, my training? professional club is in Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm still with the US national team. Um we were over in Dubai and South Africa for almost two months, um, about a month ago. And unfortunately, the last game we played, we tied to Portugal, which means we didn't book our ticket to the World Cup next year. Oh. Um, but yeah, it's part, it's, yeah. it's part of the process. And um, so the next World Cup will be 2027 in Australia. And, um, you know, for me, one of the biggest dreams I've ever had is, is to play in a World Cup. And so we talk about my dream and, and that's a big part of it. And so, you know, the next four years, whether that's moving overseas to Japan, France, England, or something and, and continuing my development and chasing the game to the, to the highest level I can, that, that most likely is in the cards. Um, yeah. But immediately it's, it's getting back to Houston next week and getting into preseason and starting the season and, uh, and then hopefully building the national team to a, a, a pretty strong position for the next world cup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's brutal, but it, yeah, it teaches you patience and oh my God. persistence, whether you want it or not. I know. And it, it's so out of my control and, you know, I can mm -hmm. focus on kind of getting myself in, in the best position possible to give what I can to the team and put our team in a good position. But um, yeah, it just reminded me that there's a lot in life I can't control. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very, very cool that you're kind of reaching out and using your cow network and everything to kind of fill this part of you as yeah, well. This so. is a big passion of mine. And so Cal is Cal and has some pretty incredible people like yourself. So uh, I've been fortunate to, to be connected to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right on. Well, happy holidays and enjoy your down week. Yep. Um, Time's Enjoy the, the ramp up. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, go and all the in-betweens. And go Bears. Okay. Exactly. Aaron, thank all you All right, so Christian. Much. Pleasure. Yep. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, to subscribe, to comment on this video. Let me know what type of people you guys want to see next. Um, whether it's more athletes. Is it a businessman or woman? Is it a health and wellness expert? Um, anybody. I'd love to share their story. I love sharing stories about chasing a dream. And together... Let's change the world.